Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. The Positively Hotline is ringing. We don't know what we're going to do. We have no plan. We're just here. Who's calling in this week? He went after her like she's made out of ham. That is interesting. That's exciting. Um, is somebody going to answer that? Hello? Hotline ringing. You're on your phone, and I don't think you're taking any of this seriously. Answer the phone! Ladies and gentlemen, let's go! It's Victoria Stowell here. I am here at the APDT conference with the most amazing trainer ever. Her name is Sue Sternberg. I know you've heard of her. She is from the Roundout Valley Kennels up in New York State, and she's going to talk to me today. I actually had um, the chance to go hear her speak this morning on resource guarding. It was fascinating. It was eye-opening. Um, and I just hope that more and more people learn from what Sue's got to say about this. Thank you so much for joining me today. And um, can you tell the people who are listening to this a little bit more about yourself? All right, so a little bit more about myself. I'm, I'm a dog trainer as much as I'm a shelter person. So I've been working in shelters and been working in dog training since 1981. And um, I am a, a student of temperament. I study the the behavior and body language of dogs to help trainers and to help people in shelters. How has, have you seen the sort of, the, the, have you seen it change in the years that you've been working in shelters? Have you seen it change? Are there more dogs being surrendered now? Are there less? Are you seeing a change in behavior? A change in the home environment? There's definitely a change. Um, I started in the um, 80s and it was there was just way more dogs way more overpopulation and so in a lot of areas you'd see uh, litters of puppies litters and litters of puppies come into the shelters and litters of puppies are the indicators of overpopulation when somebody can't find homes for puppies you know that there are more dogs than there are homes you rarely see litters of puppies today most common dogs to end up at a shelter are adolescent or adult dogs um, they're not markers of overpopulation. They're markers of the economy or of problem behavior sometimes in the dogs um, or a financial crisis with a family. Um, we're seeing a lot less dogs today. It still all seems full and overwhelming because shelters are simply holding the dogs longer. Years and years ago, they would hold them three days and euthanize or five days and euthanize or 48 hours. And so shelters, the length of stay is increasing now. Um, and that that brings up all sorts of problems of quality of life that are not being properly addressed. There are lots of people out there that think, and I'm really not from this school of thought, and I get criticized for it, that no dog should ever be put down. Once a dog goes to a shelter, they, people like the idea of no-kill shelters, and um, what happens is that dogs are being warehoused, sometimes for months, sometimes for years. I've been at shelters where dogs have been there for four, five, six years. What do you say to people like that? We're definitely in a no-kill uh, mentality, and that sounds good on the surface. What it sounds like is that we shouldn't be euthanizing a nice dog for you know arbitrary reasons. The truth about um, what goes on is you say, well, what do you do with a dangerous dog? What do you do with a dog that shouldn't be out in your community that is going to maul somebody, literally maul somebody, um, or you know hospitalize a child, or kill somebody, or kill your pet dog? There are dogs that should not be out in our community. There are dogs that simply are not pets. They're outside that range. They weren't bred as pets. They haven't been raised as pets. And now they end up in a shelter, and people think we can somehow churn them out as a safe pet. Cannot be done. Um, and when you when you say, well, there are dangerous dogs that, you know, no matter how good a trainer you are, you can't make them viable, then you say, well, what do you do with them? Do you keep them in a kennel, in a shelter cage the rest of their lives? Because you're talking... Life, lifetime, interminable amounts of time in, in a kennel. And when you look at it through quality of life and you ask, well, how do you deal with the behavioral, emotional, and mental health of a shelter dog who's there for the rest of his life because he can't go in the community, cannot be rehabilitated, then the, the no-kill issue takes on a different tone. And then you're like, well, you know, is that life better than death? And of course, we don't know. We don't know, except I'll tell you that I've been traveling to shelters since 1994 
I have seen way more cruelty to animals from within our country's shelters than I ever have from the general public. That is a devastating statement. It is the truth. And the length of stay for shelter dogs is increasing um, as time goes on. I would absolutely agree with you there. Again, I, through my work, am able to travel and go around to see a lot of shelters, film a lot of shelters, and it's very distressing because even though these animals are getting food and water and they have shelter, their men mental enrichment needs and their physical activity, it, it's just not being taken care of. And it's, it's, it's awful to see these dogs going through what essentially looks like to trauma. Yeah. It is trauma. And I, I've, I've been to no-kill shelters um, who are now in a dilemma. They're like, well, every single one of our cages is filled with a dog that's been returned multiple times, has bitten people multiple times, and they're realizing they can't keep adopting him out. And he's bitten and mauled people who work at the shelter. So they're like, well, what do we do? I'm sorry. The euthanasia is not the enemy. Um, we have made it into our enemy. For some dogs, it is not the worst thing that can happen to them. Once you understand that they're not all fixable, they're not. But there is this whole idea in this country and, and in other parts of the world as well that every dog can be fixed. Every dog can be fixed and no dog should be put down because of behavioral issues such as aggression. And it's out there and there are not just, and we're not just talking tens of people, there are thousands of people that actually believe it. And so if you do have, for example, on one of my shows, I had a cocker spaniel that mauled a child five times and scarred that child for life. Um, and when the, the dog was put down, I was called a dog killer. And I had all kinds of people that wanted to come and kill me. Um, they saw the child, the child speaking on television, showing her scars, and yet they still thought that that dog should be rehomed. Now, you, I know as well that you also get criticism for, for saying that, yes, some dogs are unworkable and some dogs should be euthanized. How do you deal with that criticism? How do you deal with what I essentially think and believe and know is ignorance? Oh, I tell you, it's very hard, and I, um, it, it's, it's, appalling to me how cruel people can be to people in the name of thinking that we're being cruel to animals and um, again you know I think once you've really seen seen a dog who's suffering every single day in a kennel environment in the name of no kill the dog is aggressive multiple bites he's violent low thresholds these things are not curable and you're not talking about the dog is in a home, there's no kids around, there's a committed owner who will manage the dog. Even then it's not curable, you just have to train somebody to try and sequester the dog into success. But um, these are dogs that don't have a home yet. Who's going to take this dog? And who wants the liability uh, of you know, putting this dog out there? I will not do it. And I, um, I don't think euthanasia is the worst thing that can happen to a dog. Um, and, um, and yet for doing it and for making that decision, very carefully making the decision, I have been threatened uh, in every single way. I've been called horrible things. I've, I've been um, people, as it's obviously happened to you, say that um, I should be euthanized. And it's just, it's, um, there's some lack of humanity there. There's some, there's a, it's a cruelty. I don't think you can be that cruel to a human and be kind to animals. I think being kind and compassionate with animals means you are kind and compassionate with, with human beings. Um, and when that, when that goes awry, it's deeply disturbing. I res very much respected what you were saying with the resource guarding um, today. Um, can you tell, again, those listeners, what is resource guarding? when we say we use that term all the time but for people who might not know exactly what it means can you explain it so resource guarding is a term that we use when a dog um, uh, finds certain items valuable like either food items his food bowl a bone a, a certain toy a ball or his owner or maybe one owner in a multiple owner household um, where the dog finds any of those things so valuable that he would use aggression to protect and keep and uh, control access to that resource. Most commonly you see it around food, um, bones that are chewed, dogs will often guard um, the dishwasher with all the loading it up with the dirty dishes, dishes, 
Dogs will guard things that they can't eat fast enough or get in it if there's competition for it. You frequently see one a dog who will guard one uh, partner in the bed when the other partner gets up to go to the bathroom. They won't let him back in the bed. They like to guard um, beds, uh, sleeping areas, resting areas. Some dogs will guard parts of their body like don't touch my feet, don't touch my neck or my ears when I say so. So I think it's one of the most common forms of aggression. You can have dogs that are competitive and guarding who don't use aggression to do that and that's really what we would want. You know, it's okay if you don't want to share your um, your bed, but maybe, you know, groan and, and move off and complain, but don't, don't as a dog, don't pull out a knife and threaten or don't slash your owner for it. We, you know, the best pet dogs have aggression thresholds that you'll never see that, you know, it's hard to, to push them to the point where they, they get um, protective over something or use aggression, but it's very common. Um, it's hard, it's easier to manage than it, and it's harder to absolutely fix, although a lot of dogs don't don't go to a dangerous level with it. You know, they just lift a lip or, you know, get annoyed, but they don't do anything huge. What a lot of people miss is the physical signs, isn't it? Dogs' body language, if they're actually communicating, and, you know, unless you're Sue Sternberg or Victoria Stillwell or a trainer or you really, really know dogs extremely well, you're going to miss this really vital body language, this language that this dog is trying to, to communicate to you. Can you tell us some of the more subtler signs that p probably the average person wouldn't know about? Yeah, there's tons of signs and if somebody can show them to you, every one of us could see them. But if nobody shows them to you, you just you don't notice things until the dog's actually flying off the couch at you or whatever. But some of the signs to look at is when a dog shows the whites of his eyes, he's usually stressed, uncomfortable, or, or guarding something. So when you see the whites of the dog's eyes, you need to slow down, back off, and assess how's the dog feeling, what's going on, and what are you doing if you're approaching too fast or invading. Um, Dogs who will guard something, uh, let's say they've got a bone and you're approaching, they will often look up at you and then quickly look back at the thing that they are guarding. And um, that's a common behavior and a good one to spot. Freezing is a really common behavior. And freezing, when a dog gets still, and it might just be one part of his body, he might just freeze his head um, and show the whites of his eyes or freeze his whole body, that's usually the warning right before he's going to growl but when dogs freeze most of them are simply trying to communicate hey back off now or I may have to use aggression so if you can understand what he's saying and back off um, you can avoid aggression it's one of the reasons why children are most commonly bitten by resource guarders they don't read any of these signs and so the dogs are giving warnings everywhere but he ends up biting a child now I've seen videos I've seen film of um even supposedly knowledgeable trainers seeing very overt signs but having this whole idea that the dog mustn't win and they these trainers become extremely confrontational very violent and then the dog bites them if we can learn anything from dogs when two dogs are interacting um, almost almost never do they resort to violence. You'll notice one dog might get angry at another or threaten to bite it. The other dog almost always gets completely still, neutral, looks away, and waits until the other dog has calmed down and then retreating. Dogs don't think of their interactions as combat or dominance or power or, you know, when you're interacting with dogs, it is not about who's going to win or lose during that interaction. Um, and especially with aggression, your goal with aggression is to keep, keep that dog from pulling out his knife and his gun and, and firing it at you. And when he pulls out his knife or his gun, it is not the time that you go at him to overpower him, whatever. You've got to say, look, this situation is lost. He has hit an aggression threshold. My dog is about to be violent don't fight. If you fight with a dog, it should be as a last resort because the dog is literally bringing you down and trying to kill you and that is so rare. When a dog is aggressive, you do not counter it with aggression. You don't fix aggression with aggression. Um, you fix it by um, cunning and understanding it and trying to manage it if you can. 
um, no, we, we should stop confronting dogs and we should stop looking at our relationship with them as a, as a win or lose. It's not a game, it's not a competition, it's a partnership, it's a cooperation. Yeah, but that doesn't fit the whole kind of machismo kind of way that we have certainly here in the United States and in other, and in other countries, does it? No. But doesn't it make for sexy t television when you see man battle with dog and man wins and dog is submissive? I mean, we love that in our culture. We don't particularly, but people love that because they don't know any difference. Yeah. Can you explain that? Um, I, I think what people love is the idea of a quick fix, a big blowout confrontation with some quick resolution and TV can make a dog behavior problem look like in half an hour it's edited down to a final product and in in the in truth of dog training and behavior modification first of all very few owners have the time to do all the tedious amounts of work needed to move a dog's threshold to, to make him better and um, and there's nothing glitzy or sexy or um, you know, um, slick about what, what real dog training and real dog behavior is like. It's slow, it's tedious, it's a tremendous amount of time and work, and then, um, and it is never a quick fix. The, most dogs are not cured, they are better, and you learn to communicate with them better, and you learn to compromise on some of the, the triggers, but it makes for boring TV. And, and you know, I, I, I have four dogs. I am their leader. I am their guide. I am their mentor. I am their role model. And I protect them. I, I take care of them. I take care of their needs. I certainly will say no if they need to hear a no. But um, I am not a dominatrix. I do not try to overpower them. We are in a partnership together. And it is of mutual respect. They don't they don't dominate me, they don't come at me, they don't use physical force on me and I won't do it on them. I think you said the word leader, I mean obviously there's another word out there, pack leader, which makes me laugh really because hey, you're not a dog, you're not part of the dog pack, you're a human, a dog knows that you're a human, you're different from them. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can't be a leader, you can be the kind of e leader that can influence behavior in your dog without the use of this confrontation and force and the severe punishment. I also believe that you need to give discipline, but discipline to guide your dog into making the right choices, into setting your dog up for success rather than this domination. Um, and it was interesting because what, what you were saying, when I started my show, which was in late 2004, I started my show, I was all about, oh, this is going to be so exciting, I'm going to show people how to train their dogs in a more in a positive way. I was, I used more sound aversion when I first started, which I don't use anymore, but that's as far as I would go, and, um, and then very quickly I realized that's not what the producers wanted. That's not, because to sit down and watch the whole process, A, you're going to be there for hours and hours and hours, and B, how boring is clicker training? How boring is clicker training to watch for hours and hours and hours? So I learned very, very quickly. And then I had this whole people coming up to me thinking it was done quickly. So then I had to go, okay, on my show, this is a long process. I'm giving you the tools. This is how you start. We're going to come back and see where you've got to, but this is work in progress. This is going to be a life thing. And, and so I learned, but it was, uh, I learned the hard way, I think. And so I'm really glad you said that because I think it's really important that people understand it's not a quick fix. If you had one thing to say to our listeners, what would it be regarding dogs and the relationship? Dogs will respond and behave for those who are the most fun. And if you can show your dog that you provide not just all the safety and and um, the pleasures, but that you are fun to be with and are a good guide, they will do anything for you. If you're not fun, if you're not sharing uh, your all your fa fun things with your dog, you're not hiking with him and taking him for walks, and if you're not his best, most fun partner, um, you will not get any respect and you will they will not follow you that's what being a good leader is just being a great person to your dog I think you really hit the nail on the head because if you want your dog to follow you it's a relationship based on cooperation and not domination it's a it's mutual respect 
honor, we must learn more about how they communicate so we can read them better. They're studying us all the time. They're trying so hard to learn what we want to teach them. We need to learn what they are trying to teach us as well. If people want to know more about you, you, I know you talk all around the country. If people want to come to a talk, and I would absolutely advise every single person who's listening to this podcast, please go and see this lady talk. She's not only, I mean, she's very funny while she talks too. She tells great stories, great anecdotes, but you see amazing video, and, and you really get it. You know, you really get it. So um, where, should, where should our listeners go to to find out more information about the talks that you're doing and about more information about you? Um, you can go to www.greatdogproductions.com. They have a, uh, they sell all of my videos, DVDs, um, my um, dog park app, um, clothes and stuff to make you look good when you train your dog. And uh, they're going to take over and have all my schedule. You can also email me there um, and get a hold of me um, and find out where I'm going to be and what I've got available. Sue Sternberg, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you so much, Victoria. Hey, you got something on your mind? What are you, a wizard, a genius? How do they make a miniature? I mean, is there some way, some process they, they physically miniaturize the dog? or is it a-